Look, there are two kinds of people in this world, and only two. And Danny, I'm not going to do it again. Two. I'm not going to do it here on Cardinals Underground, all brought to you by Pacific Office Automation. There are those folks who can change their own tire and those who cannot. Or maybe those who are willing and those who are absolutely refuse to change their own tire. Danny, which one would you be, the former or the latter? I do not know how to change a tire, Paul. Yeah. It drives my grandfather nuts that I am driving a car on a road without knowing how to change my own tire. So your grandfather tried and failed to teach no, you? No, he never tried to teach me. I think he wanted my dad to teach me. Gotcha. Well, when in doubt, but outsource it. why would I need it, to yeah. know how to change a tire when I've got... You know, roadside assistance. Right. When you got we got the cell phone, you know. Back when I was your age, we didn't have this ability, right? You had to, now you just instantly connect with someone and they're out there in a matter of moments. So I do know how to change a tire. Quick, quick story. I was teaching my son, my older son, how to drive. Okay. Had my my nice Mazda six. It was only a couple years old at that time. We went to the local high school parking lot. Now, was this an automatic or manual transmission? It's aut- automatic. Okay. I learned on a manual, but yeah. he, it was automatic. Easy peasy. Yeah, kids don't know how to drive a stick these days, Calvisi. First time he's ever behind the wheel. I'm like, we're going to take this. I just want you to know what it's like. Like, I don't want you going fast. And we're, we're in a parking lot with, like, speed bumps everywhere. So it's not like he – so we're, like, moving. I roll down the windows. It's, it's a nice day. Uh, we're moving at, like, 10 miles an hour. But all the windows are down. And somehow he can't keep it quite straight. And not only are there speed bumps, but there's also like raised curbs where we're driving. Row, row. And he manages to take my front right tire and shred it at eight miles an hour. <laughs> what? As I hear bang, and then and then with the windows down, all you could hear was shh <laughs> with all the all the air going out. In those days, I I didn't keep my temper. As much as I do now, I I never s- said anything like I was like I, I was like a volcano that wasn't quite going. You didn't need the jack; you just lifted the car yourself because it was the rage flowing through you. Called my wife, and I'm like, Alec, flatten the tire. We're gonna be a minute. He's like scared, witless, and all I can remember is saying, "Well." You might as well learn how to change a tire while we're doing this. And I got everything out, and I made him watch me how to change the tire. So I'm pretty sure he knows how to change a tire. Let's not share stories about first time we were behind the wheel. Uh-oh. One of the first times we were behind Uh-oh. the wheel. <laughs> you, uh, you needed a ride home? Is that what you're saying, Danny? No. I, when my dad and I, like by the middle school, high school, um, like the track, the, the parking lots there, the car was parked. My dad must have been picking me up from soccer practice and was like, drive us home five minutes max to my house and the way the parking where we were parked was right up against the grass right by the tennis courts and I thought I put the car in reverse and turns out I put it in drive when then I go and I accelerate Uh, (laughs) thankfully I didn't run into the tennis courts but my dad was not happy about uh, not paying attention to the details Mm. when putting the car in reverse buddy of mine backed into uh, another buddy of mine's driveway in high school, decided he was going to leave uh, Bernie marks on the guy's driveway. Oh, Jesus. Didn't put it into drive. Hit the gas, something fierce. Somehow, because he had teenage reflexes, went from the gas to the brake, skidded to a stop a millimeter short of the garage door. Oh, my goodness. Yeah, we were almost in their living room, so that was always. Uh, this is not uh, content for Motor Trend TV. This is actually Cardinals Underground. Once again, just to maybe reintroduce the show, we are talking football. And, uh, well, let's see. If Grandma got run over by a reindeer, the Cardinals' run defense got run over by Kyron Williams and Royce Freeman. I don't know if that's where you guys want to start. It always starts with the run game, I'm told. You have to run the ball and stop the run. And uh, Cardinals definitely, well, they didn't stop the run, and it seemed like they went away from the run against the Rams. Well, Kyron Williams is obviously going to want to play against the Cardinals every week if possible. Yes. There's a reason he came off the injury yeah. list in time for the Cardinals game. But but it was kind of strange that they got away from the run as much as they did, that James Conner only had six carries, that Kyler Murray only ran at one time. Now, I, I was talking to our good friend Craig Rielu about that, and we were looking it up. It does feel like the Rams are one of those teams that does a really nice job of preventing Kyler from hurting them with his legs. 
And if you go back and look, I think out of like we were looking at like the lowest rushing totals in Kyler's career, and out of like the top fifteen lowest, like four or five of them were Rams games. And I know they play them more often, but I do think that they have they they have figured out some way to like make sure he stays within the pocket more so than I think some other teams. James Conner had a season low 27 yards, which is interesting because typically even when it might not look like Conner has a lot to, a lot of room, he's able to push through and get that extra yardage and that just wasn't there. I'm not sure if you put most of that blame on blocking on Conner on timing. I, I'm not really sure if there was just too much pressure or what was going on. L.A. picked up right where they left off, though, Paul, which was running the ball from week six. Yeah. In that first matchup, they had five rushing yards in the first half and 174 in the second. And Kyron Williams had 158 of those. And even though the Cardinals' defense knew what was coming on Sunday, it wasn't en- it's one thing to know what's coming. It's another to stop it. And the yeah. defense had their worst rushing performance of how many yards were allowed, and they just got run all over. So Calvisi Consulting, the Pauly Pigskin Division, uh, I'm over my skis with the following suggestion that in the offseason, uh, I think you really need to work on fitting the run scheme that you see four times a year between the Niners and the Rams. That, that zone scheme. We saw Christian McCaffrey in week four, over five yards of carry, three rushing touchdowns. You have now seen Kyron Williams twice, at least three halves of football, be dominant against the Cardinals. We talked to Lorenzo Alexander on the Red Sea Report earlier today just about fitting that run scheme and a lot of it starts with the d-line and if you're getting turned like if they're stringing you out laterally and your shoulder pads are getting turned perpendicular to the line of scrimmage you're done you need an ultra aggressive defensive line that's getting upfield getting between you know double team blocks at least you know one gapping you can't be two gapping and waiting you have to be aggressive get up the field force the running back out of a lane or his desired route Make him make a choice before he gets to the perimeter and he has blockers and he's able to stoke it north. And you just saw too much of that. And then they brought in the heavy hitter Royce Freeman there in the second half. Here comes 240 pounds downhill. And when your top three tacklers are all DBs, when it's Buda Baker and Keetrell Clark, nine apiece, and then Jalen Thompson right behind him, that's an indication that those running backs are getting to the second level. L.A. had no reason to throw the ball. Why would you put the ball in jeopardy? Why would you put that you know, at risk when you can run the ball and be as successful as they were. This was a game where you really realized what you have in Kaiser White as your linebacker who is calling the defense who's out on IR with a biceps injury. That's not to to knock Josh Woods or Chris Barnes in terms of calling the defense and echoing the plays. I think you just realized, similar to Abuda Baker, the way that Kaiser flies around the field and the power he's able to have in those tackles and how few players get past him to someone like Abuda Baker. Yeah. I think that tackling was noticeably off without Kaiser White out on the field. Because the Rams O-line, dare I say, ain't all that. They're not 228 yards worth of rushing. Now, how much of that was um, the lack of, quote, enthusiasm? by the Cardinals team, especially after things got lopsided. But I'll tell you this much, and, and, and I said as much on Red Sea Report, is it was mid-third quarter. They kicked the field goal. It's 24-8. to eight. So technically, it's still a two-possession game if you get a pair of two-point conversions. And there was a starter for the Cardinals going up and down the sideline. Let's go. Let's act like it's a two-possession game because the energy was anything but. Yeah, and, when, and when that game kicked off, I, it was awful quiet down there. And, and sometimes that's a harbinger of things to come, and sometimes it isn't. And we went through that in 2021 and 22. There were games that lacked effort and uh, just didn't quite have the same urgency, intensity, and energy. And when the Rams went down and scored in nine plays right off the bat, boom, you're like, ruh row, that was a bit of a – but then the Cardinals go 12 plays, 75 yards. I'm like, okay, yeah, that isn't an indication of anything. Well, ultimately it was, and it was cited by the head coach. It was interesting because when this team has been down this year, the the effort's always been there, which is what JG said, but the energy has still been there. We've talked about seeing the fight from this team, and the previous game in Houston is a great example. The Cardinals gave up 333 total yards in the first half, came out, had a great second half. You were down only 11 points at the half, not 16 So the fact that L.A. came out and was immediately dominating in the run game, 
the fact that we didn't see those sort of halftime adjustments, we didn't see the energy that we've seen when the Cardinals have been in similar positions earlier in the year, that was noticeably different. And I'm not sure why this was the time that was the case. I do think, and, and I think this came up in the mailbag. I mean, sometimes, sometimes there's going to be clunkers. I, I, that doesn't make it okay. And I understand why people are frustrated, but the I, Niners just lost three in a row. Yeah, I mean, you're, sometimes you're going to have a clunker, and that's kind of what this felt like a little bit all the way around, rightly or wrongly. And I can come up, especially home games especially, I feel like, Paul, you and I have seen a number of them over the years where you're like, wait, what What? What just happened in that game? That, that There was a home loss to Carolina against P.J. Walker. Yeah. you know, There was that road loss at Detroit. Where we, that was 22. Yeah, wow. where we half-joked. Or you 21, need, 21. You needed to run jumper cables from yeah. the team bus all the way to the metal bench. Everyone sit down and gun the engine. Back back in 2008, before the Super Bowl run, Yeah, they were, had a home game against yeah. the Vikings and Tavares Jackson, who threw like four he, touchdown passes. And here's my theory on that, because it happens to any team in any sport in any season. You're going to get that one clunker, as you call it. And, and here's my theory why. To these professional athletes, this is their job show of hands who brings it 100 percent intensity to their job every single work day me no no one no lie detector you say no <laughs> no lie detector can we get a can we get a buzzer in here so to some degree that's the case now i will say this and, and i don't know if i'm going out on a limb here or not i think there are two things you will not see the rest of the season there are five games to go you will not see the cardinals ignore james connor again i think the coaches feel like that was a mistake you got four carries on the first drive and two the rest of the game. And you won't see Keontae Ingram. Wait, what? You're right. Okay. Number 30. So, Go ahead. No, I was just going to say he got released, so you're definitely yep. not going to see yep. him. And don't think that doesn't send a message because there is one tried and true way to motivate in professional sports, and that's job security. Yeah. So uh, whether that was going to happen or not, never necessarily a bad thing if you're going to make that move to make it after a poor loss and you send a message that – there will be blood, right? Here's the other thing I don't think we're going to see a lack thereof the rest of the way, and that's that fight you referenced. That's what Dennis Gardek called it after the game in our post-game radio interview. I asked him about the energy, and he said, well, the fight. He said, I wanted to see more fight. And um, I think that message was delivered to that locker room, and I'm guessing, I'm going gonna, I'm, I'm gonna to surmise that that will be that. I don't know if there's going to be you know, how many more wins there are the rest of the way, but I don't think you're going to see that lackluster effort again. It's funny. Jonathan Gannon, when he first came into the press conference after the game, talked about missing effort and energy. And then he quickly dialed it back. Now, this is my theory. I have not talked to Jonathan Gannon about this, but my theory is is that is what he was thinking. Sure. Except you don't want to say that publicly and throw your players under the bus about effort because that is, that is definitely a, a, a hot-button topic, I would think, among players. But, I mean, I think it's fair to say. And, and the thing is, is, like, it, it's really hard when you, you start getting into the, the weeds of fight and effort and energy. And I'm like, okay, exactly how are we parsing all these things? Because they feel like kind of the same thing, don't they? Yes. Yeah. I mean, I, I know when I throw out energy, intensity, urgency, fight, it really just means tenacity, doesn't it? It means 11 hats to the football, which I think – for the first time all year, save a little bit here and there, like that first half against Houston, you know, you just didn't see it. And then when you brought in, like, for example, when you brought in Royce Freeman and he's 240, and now he's running through DBs, and he's getting chunk runs, because guess what? There's not 11 hats to the ball. There were too many solo tackles to begin with. And if you look at some of the tackle totals, Buddha and Jalen and Keetrell Clark had a ton of solo tackles. I think part of it, too, is this was really the first game where you were pretty healthy when it comes to your starters and you had this type of performance. The other the other game that was similar to this was in Cleveland. You had Clayton Toon as your starting quarterback. You had just traded Josh Dobbs. You knew that Kyler Murray's return was very near at that point. You kind of knew what you were going into with that game. So the fact that you had a healthy Kyler Murray and James Conner and Buda Baker and Jalen Thompson this time around. And this is the performance you had as a whole. Throughout the rest of the season, it's really been, even if the offense hasn't had a great game, the defense has done well. They have gotten to the quarterback. They have forced turnovers. They have either stopped the run game or the passing game pretty well. So the fact that the offense didn't have a good game and the defense didn't have a good game really kind of feels like the first time again, minus 
Cleveland that nothing was really working. And then on top of that, you're having some problems with penalties or a missed field goal on special teams, which is also an area that this team has really consistently made plays with this year and, and been good on that side. It really was all three phases that were just off and underperforming. I I want to give props to Ohms. He was, when we're talking about clunkers, I mean, let's look at the Broncos who are now in the playoff chase. That team gave up 70 points one day. <laughs> You wondered if Vance Joseph was going to survive yeah. the seventy burger put on him by Miami, right? And now their defense is playing yeah. pretty well. Yeah. Look, when it turns, it turns. I mean, if you get it right, all of a sudden it will turn in a hurry. Look at the Diamondbacks. Look at what the Suns did once they got Chris Paul. Right? Once, I mean, you can go from sixty losses to sixty wins in the NBA if you just get another player or two. So don't get Darren started. You know. I think we all agree they have the coaching staff. They have the leadership. There's enough dogs in that locker room. This isn't going to be a constant. It's just tough when you're on that sideline. And, hey, there's Antonio Hamilton. He's in sweats, and he's coaching up Keetrell Clark and Starling Thomas. Hey, there's Kaiser White. Oh, he's in street clothes, and he's talking to Josh Bar- or Chris Barnes and Josh Woods. And there's Kevin Strong, and he's in sweat. I mean, there's a lot of – you're missing four of your top five defensive linemen. They're missing the quarterback. Of, of your defense you know Marco Wilson isn't getting a single snap you know there's just a lot of a lot of change down there I don't know how much if anything that had to do with it but we know in the past if you go into a game without a quarterback and you get down a couple of scores things can get sideways in a hurry because the rest of the team doesn't believe you have the capability to come back and as Jonathan Gannon did cite once it got lopsided in that scoreboard in the fourth quarter things were a little different It's difficult because on top of having to deal with adversity and injuries on this defense, the defensive line, the linebackers room, you are just finished week 12. Typically, that's later than you'd like to be going through any sort of evaluation process. That's not where the Cardinals find themselves. The fact that they're still evaluating on a weekly basis who their starting cornerbacks are going to be, that adds an extra layer of challenges because you don't have that consistency and What is going on with a veteran like Marco Wilson, who through week seven played 100% of the defensive snaps and then watched them dwindle and then only played special teams this year? So now you have two rookies in Keetra Clark and Starling Thomas starting. What was the most interesting part of that entire scenario for me, though, is when Thomas went out with an ankle injury and was immediately ruled out, Marco Wilson didn't go up in his place. It was the rookie, Devon Wilson, who was elevated from the practice squad. So on top of the injuries and adversity, it, life is just more difficult for this defense because they're very clearly still having to evaluate, which is partially the expectation of where this team stood before the season started, this coaching staff, what they're having to figure out, the front office is having to figure out, a lot of players in contract years, and obviously when you have so much draft capital. So I'm not saying I'm, I'm confused or I'm upset by any of this. I'm just saying it's more difficult on top of the adversity you're already facing in a regular season to now also still be having to evaluate players and who gives you the best chance to win if that's changing week after week. And don't think the evaluation does not continue, right? After you went through an off season of no allegiances and the roster reset, I mean, you could have the seventh purge movie, you know, if you want this off season. <laughs> Because really, I was, uh, just when I think it's I over, I saw the Paul. look. I saw well, no. the look. I thought that's where it was How going. How many are there? There's so there's six. Well, I'm glad you asked, Danny. There's the purge. <laughs> there's the purge anarchy. First purge, forever purge, purge election year, and then what we call the big red reset purge uh, this past off season. When are they going to become a sponsor? So I when, would never watch the movies because I don't yeah. like scary movies. What but. would the seventh one be called then? That's a good question. You should be sponsored yeah. as individually, Paul. You could be an influencer that's for right. the purge movies. Sure, that's right. Uh, yeah. <laughs> Pauly Purge. We'll we'll get on that. <laughs> That'll be good. I mean, you still you, you you know unless you're a handful of players who are made men on this roster, you better put good film out there because to your point, the evaluation does continue. I think the big question is at quarterback. You know, where are they with Kyler? Where is Kyler? Was that just a hiccup in that game? It's still confounding. Just like the first series versus the rest of the game was perplexing. Right, Everything you did in that first series, you didn't really see again the rest of the game, uh, whether it was under center or James Conner. Um, you know, with Kyler Murray, what you saw in this game, you didn't see in the Atlanta game, when he, his first game in 11 months. So, okay, what does that mean? It's almost like you, know, you watch it and I'm like, okay, wait a minute. They're not moving the pocket as much as the Atlanta game. He wasn't on the move. There weren't the boots, the waggles, the half rolls. 
it's almost like they were they had tasked Kyler with let's see you from the pocket, let's see you attack a defense from the pocket. It's possible. I mean, I'm not going to rule it out. I, I, it, it still seems likely. Okay, this these are the things we are doing to because they're the best things we have or whatever. But it, it does feel like there's been some moments there where it's like, okay, let's try and run this and and Kyler says he can do it and let's see let's see what it looks like when he's doing it. And the only thing that makes me hesitate on that stuff is the emotion that the quarterback especially is wearing after these games are over. I mean, he he doesn't look like he, he said the right things after the game, but he did not look happy. I mean, he was saying he wasn't discouraged, he was saying he was staying positive, but and I'm not blaming him for looking down, but he, he, he looked like he was a little down. No doubt. I mean, he has that look like, I'll do anything to win, whatever it takes. So, you know, to surmise that maybe they're doing certain things to get a look or evaluate, yeah, that doesn't sound plausible because he, he is definitely seeking the W. There's no doubt about that. Here's my other just speculation, thinking out loud, a little thought bubble over here, okay? If – the first drive looks different than the rest of the game. What is the difference? Well, the first drive is scripted. First 15 plays are scripted. Is the rest of the game then dictated more by the quarterback? And is the quarterback changing a lot of plays and or calling plays, especially when they go tempo? You saw Matthew Stafford do a lot of that. I think that's what I wanted an answer to, is if Kaiser White was out there, an experienced middle linebacker against Matthew Stafford, who seemingly was changing a lot of stuff. And Sean McVay has done that for years. Get up on the ball till there's 15 seconds on the play clock. I can talk into the you know, device and the helmet of my quarterback. And then all of a sudden, for example, on that Jalen Thompson trail blitz, here's the screen that hits for the touchdown. Perfect call. He recognized it. Whereas Lorenzo Alexander told us in the Red Sea Report, he thought the Rams – Secondary did an excellent job at disguising when they were too high versus one high, and they were, you know, post snap getting into different looks. Did a really good job of disguising and or confusing, you know, the Cardinals' offense at times, yeah, because there were ten pass deflections in the game. That's a lot. So, were receivers not in the right spot at the right time? Was Kyler maybe a half second slow getting to those spots, giving the DBs a chance to recover and get their hands in there and break up a pass. It just didn't seem like the Cardinals passing game was a step ahead. And and you're right, Paul, and that that didn't feel like for the sole fact that you didn't have Michael Wilson who was out with a shoulder injury. I'm not sure how much, not to say he wouldn't have changed the game in any manner, but for the points that you're mentioning of, it didn't feel like the the passing game was off because of size or contested throws. It does feel like the timing, and I say that because that's something we have brought up at least the last two weeks with Kyler and his receivers, and it's not just the struggling connection with Hollywood Brown. There's been multiple instances where he struggled to hit Trey McBride, and to me that does seem like a combination. It seems like we've seen a combination of communication in terms of does he want his receivers sitting in the route, does he want them on the move, throwing you know in front of them and then there also seems like times where Kyler hangs on to the ball for just a split second too long and that's what I think about on that fourth down with Trey McBride and and getting broken up is that that is more what that felt like to me you know we speculated that Kyler might actually go through his reads a lot better minus DeAndre Hopkins because it wasn't incumbent upon him or he didn't feel pressure to get D-Hop his dozen targets per game and maybe in the past he was looking for D-Hop a little too much and then forcing the ball D-Hop's away. So I was taking a look here. Marquise Hollywood-Brown had, look at it, a dozen targets. Because there were times on the game where, I'll be honest, I'm on the side and going, man, I wonder if he's forcing a little too much maybe, to Hollywood. But I, I would love to know when those times. It felt like about six of those targets were in the, like, the last ten minutes of the true, game. When, true. And someone did ask Hollywood at his locker, just watching the video back, and I know you guys were in the locker room, but there was a question to Hollywood about, oh, maybe you discovered – you know, some chemistry and a connection in this game, and, and, and Hollywood dismissed the question. So, no, we were just playing catch-up towards the end. Like, game was already decided when I got some it's catches. It's time. Yeah. It was go- and yeah. Kyler basically said the same thing when I asked him about working with Hollywood. Gotcha. Like, that was just the game. Yeah. So, I don't... Okay. So, there's still well, there's still ground to make up. There's still progress to be made. Feels like Yes. It. Yeah. But I will say, I do like the fact that neither of them are saying, I need to get him the ball more. I need to force the ball to him. Now, of course, both of them would like those things to happen. 
But Hollywood Brown feels very different than not just DeAndre Hopkins, but I think a lot of those, you know, receivers who have been the number one receiver for a long time in their career. Hollywood is not out here he, when he's talking to the media with or without a camera in his face. He's not having this demeanor and he's not saying things like, I need the ball. I, you know, I'm a top receiver. I, you know, I can make every catch. He's not saying those things. He's not, and Kyler's not saying, I need to get him the ball because, you know, I know he can make those catches and all that stuff. It, it The two of them seem to really have the same mindset of it's fluid. It's going to be natural. If it works, great. If there are better reads out there, that's what Kyler's going to target. And I will say, if you're not having that connection, at least the two of them aren't going to that, to, to say those yeah. types of things, which is good. I, I agree with everything. So I guess there's really nothing for me to say. Wow. Clip that, Omo. Well, it was mid-second quarter. It was the first play of a possession, and Kyler missed Hollywood deep, underthrew it, and immediately pointed to himself. But that was a ball that came out, once again, what Kyler called last week goofy, just came out weird, awkward, a wobbler slash a duck, and then he immediately came to the sideline after that series and started talking to the equipment guys, which was interesting. So... Uh, don't know exactly what was going on there. I'm guessing someone's going to ask Kyler about that this week as to whether, you know, I don't know, do they need to put the footballs in the humidor or something? I, I, I don't know exactly. I don't know. The roof was open. Did that change the conditions? You know, it wasn't no, it was 80, 90 degrees Paul. in there. No, it was absolutely beautiful. But did that make the football a little more slick maybe? I don't know. Was it not well, as tacky because would, it wasn't as hot? I would recommend that Kyler pulls the same maneuver you do, which is not look at the weather forecast until Friday of this week, if that's a concern. Yeah, I don't look at that, Paul. Or, or, or more importantly, look at the, uh, you know, don't, don't trust your eyes on these weather reports until you get to Friday, okay? I know, you, you know, the, the coach likes to say, trust your eyes. No, not until we get to Friday. These meteorologists, you kidding me? I've spent 30 years in a newsroom with these meteorologists. Nobody gets away with being wrong more often than the weather people. Kidding me? Anyway, just pack your ring gear, Paul. Uh, maybe Kyler needs to go. Kyler needs to go. And now I'm thrown with, <laughs> with the Kurt Warner, the whole glove approach. You know, what if Kyler shows up with the glove, like S- the gloved one? Speaking of Kurt, I've noticed uh, there was a weather game. Somebody made comment of the uh, was it Iowa State? Somebody. Oh, yeah. Kansas State. K-State, Iowa State was playing in the snow this weekend. And yes, and, they were. And Kurt chimed in and and God bless Kurt. He continues to go with the domes for everybody and he will not give that up he he wants indoor sports indoor football all the time regardless spoken like a great former arena league quarterback yeah. right that doesn't want the yeah. th- that wants the true football to be seen right. and not be uh, impacted by the weather Danny, do you want to switch the whole Pittsburgh and Chicago? Maybe you can take the uh, the Pittsburgh gig. I mean, I'm not sure Chicago is going to be much better, Paul. You still might be getting the better end here. Let's let's make a deal. (laughs) Uh, You know, maybe I'll stick with uh, curtain number one and not trade it for curtain (laughs) number two. Maybe I'll. (laughs) Oh, boy. Okay. So here's somebody explain this to me. The Cardinals have won the turnover battle in six games, and they're one and five. That is a winning stat, winning the turnover battle. Uh, Yet, Points off takeaways in those six games, 16 points. That That's the kicker for me. It's one thing to say win or lose because there's so much more that goes into a game. Now, turnover battle absolutely increases your chances, right? Momentum and getting the ball back and all of those things are scoring off a turnover. But that's my problem is you have all of these turnovers and you're getting maybe three points, not even consistently because this offense hasn't been able to find rhythm. They can't string downs together. It's get on the field, get off the field, and that is difficult for the offense to find rhythm. It's difficult for the defense to catch their breath. That's the problem is you're not putting points on the board after turnovers. You're not playing complimentary football. I'm going to I'm gonna go glass, maybe not half full, quarter full. Whoa. Okay. Um, they are doing a good, fairly good job taking care of the football this year. They are, yep. And they and while they don't get all the turnovers all the time, they, they do take care of the football. Now, again – if you don't have the rest of it, if you're not scoring off the turnovers you have or if you, one of the reasons you're not turning the ball over is because you're having too many three and outs on offense and you just don't have the ball to turn it over, that's not good. Yeah. Or you're not going downfield with the ball like the Chicago Bears on Monday Night Football where half their plays literally were behind the line of scrimmage. That's really That, not that got really frustrating. That, that was to very watch. tedious. Yeah, Get ready for that game in Chicago if they're running that offense. Wow. Well, especially when it's snowing and – Keep it coming, Darren. Yeah. 
the uh, don't speak. Merry it in, Christmas. No, don't speak it into existence. So, um, have you ever thought about getting a, a heated vest, Paul? That's a serious question. I, I thought about that. Right. Uh, I don't. Do they make heated vests? Yes, they do. What is power in the heated vest? Is this it's like a, it's an a battery? Iron, is this like an Iron Man thing? And there's like a nuclear no, it's, reactor it's in a your battery. chest. And what is this? They're, they're supposedly pretty thin. <laughs> I see. And it's a battery pack that okay. you just charge, and then you put it on. It's yeah. supposed to keep you warm. Well, you, you probably won't encounter this sort of um, physicality that I've encountered, Danny. Um, now hopefully, you don't. But there have been times in snow games where I've tried to get near the heat blower. And uh, I'll get a stiff arm. Dudes will just shove me away. Like, players only, Cal VC. And they'll shove me away. And I'm like, come on. Can't you make room over here a little bit, a little bit? Let me get Maybe we around. can go in on a heated vest and we That's can right. rotate between the games. True. You're right. You know, let's just expense it. Our, our boss, the <laughs> VP, Tim Delaney, won't, won't so notice. So you're just going to share one? I mean, Cardinals Underground has a budget, Darren. Let's, we're going <laughs> to we're gonna submit an invoice. You, are, you guys are kind of the same size. <laughs> oh, man. Here we go. Well, it's just a matter of time. It's just a matter of time for that blew up in my face. <laughs> So I get from being the snarky guy over here. Uh, okay, so Steelers, um, here's my recommendation. Uh, <laughs> when in doubt, just steal someone else's game plan. Somehow the Steelers are 7-4, and four, and they're leading the AFC wildcard chase, and they just played the first game where they outgained an opponent. Their first time in 59 games where they gained more than 400 yards. Think about that. So we're catching them on a hot streak. What Coincidence is, after firing their offensive coordinator? Who says you need a stinking QB1? Kenny Pickett has two touchdown passes since week four, yet he hasn't thrown a pick in seven straight games. Should should we have Kyle DeRoney come on and talk about his boy Kenny Pickett? <laughs> they played high school football together. I mean, what in the Sam name of Trent Dilfer is going on here in terms of being a game manager, right? He's letting this, uh, this Steelers defense cook, and they're running the ball with a pair of running backs, Najee Harris, and, and it's working. And, of course, they have a head coach who hasn't experienced a losing season in 17 NFL campaigns. That is ridiculous. Pretty sure he's not going to this year either. Yeah. So uh, even though they play in the toughest division in the NFL, it's, uh, it, it's quite remarkable to see what the Steelers are doing. I saw a fine, fine stat today, Paul. Oh, boy. Here we go. Um, since uh, the moon landing. 69? The... Carolina Panthers have had uh, the since the moon landing. The Steelers have had half the number of coaches that the Panthers have had since David Tepper took over. If you oh include interims, goodness, wow! They've had three coaches. The Panthers have had six since David Tepper bought his team. Okay, I don't, I don't want to be the topper guy, but here's one, Danny. Oh. Tell me what you think of this one. An in-season firing for the Steelers is the ultimate rarity, right? This is the first time they fired in season a head coach or coordinator since World War II, 1941. How old were you then, Darren? <laughs> okay. That's good. I, I deserve that. I'm sorry. I enjoyed that. <laughs> uh, so I deserve that. The, it, it, it's not the Steelers' way. That's just not what they do. But, you know, when, when you have crowds at the Pittsburgh Penguins hockey game chanting, Fire Canada, uh, it just it got, a little, it got a little extreme. And so Matt Canada uh, was relieved of his duties as offensive coordinator, and they split it. They split it between Mike Sullivan, he's the play caller, and then the running backs coach, whose name I doesn't have in front. Oh, here it is, Eddie Faulkner, right? So he's the interim OC. He's the guy holding the meetings and game planning, but then Mike Sullivan, the quarterback's coach, is calling plays. I asked someone about that. They said theoretically because probably Kenny Pickett is used to hearing the voice of Mike Sullivan, the quarterback's coach, so he's the one actually calling the plays into the helmet. Okay. Whatever. They've topped 150 yards rushing in each of the last four games. That's where you need to be concerned, considering what just happened against the Rams. I would imagine that's the very first part of Pittsburgh's game plan, coming off the week that the Cardinals just had, trying to stop the Rams and Rams and being unsuccessful, especially in a weather game like this, where, sure, some of the players might have experienced that at other earlier points in their career or in college or where they grew up, but... It's different when you're not consistently practicing in cold or rainy or snowy weather. I, I, I don't necessarily think it's a huge disadvantage for the Cardinals, but I, I don't think it necessarily helps them I, I, with the it, situation they're going into. I think the running first is always the Steelers' first game plan. It doesn't matter who they're playing or what decade they're playing in. I mean, didn't didn't one of the didn't they have issues with Bruce Arians right before he left because he. Oh, yeah. He's throwing the ball too much. Oh, yeah. No, you're right. Yeah. And too many chunk throws. 
the whole no biscuit, no no risk and no biscuit thing, they they were not down with that. That was not the Steeler way either. Absolutely not. So uh, when he got refired, right, and hired by the uh, Cardinals, then uh, subsequently, it turns out he did not retire. Um, Can't Wolf talk to his brother and get some sort of scoop on Pittsburgh's oh, game plan or something? One. Yeah, that's a good one. You're right. It's, uh, he does play-by-play or color for them. He's the color analyst, Craig Wolfley. He was a former offensive lineman for 12 years for the Steelers. So uh, we might see Craig on Saturday. Hopefully we do. And, um, yeah, like, you know, I went on Wolf's show earlier, and I, as I tweeted out, at Paul Calvisi, uh, why can't I go on Craig's uh, radio show? You know, I, I'm, I'm sick and tired of going on Ron's radio show. Uh, can I please go on Craig's radio show, and we can talk ourselves some real football around here. But it is amazing. They have the same voice. They have the same wrestling Such announcer voice. Such a unique voice. voice. Yes. And to have multiple, yes. I mean, obviously they're brothers, but yeah. to have multiple yeah. people with that unique voice is yeah. cool. So... Uh, and Big Mac Starks will be on the sideline. You can't miss him because he's six foot eight. So he's down on the sideline uh, doing the radio sideline reporter gig down there. So um, yeah, if we have inclement weather, maybe I'll just stand next to Big Max and he can he can be my uh, my tarp of sorts down there. Are we giving a shout out to the Jags today? Because they beat the Texans. <laughs> oh, you're right. I just looked at that. So right now the Texans would pick 17th. That would be the Cardinals pick. It went from 20. 17th hey, right I now. Hey, I like that. Hey, real, if every week it'll update. go down three, then we're, we're cooking by the end of the season. In fact, I called it up here. Here's the remaining games, the final six for the Houston Texans. Broncos, mm. uh, That I'm, I'm just going to, okay, let's just say, against the Broncos, loss. What? Where is that game? Uh, it's home against the Broncos. Oh, okay. At the Jets, win. Yeah. At the Titans, I'm going to say loss. The Titans are 4-0 at home. It's their only four wins all at home. They're undefeated. That's a division game. And then they're home against the Browns, mm. quarterback issues. Home against the Titans, that'll be a dub. And then at the Colts, Colts are the m- most perplexing team in the NFL right now. How, are, how do they have a winning record with Gardner Minshew? Shout out to Shane Steichen, right, and what he's done in Indianapolis. I don't know. But anyway, that's, that's where that stands. Maybe, just maybe, if the Cardinals are lucky, C.J. Stroud will hit the rookie wall, El Grande, and then all of a sudden his play will fall off significantly i don't think so probably not gonna happen uh it's called wishful thinking over there okay uh so anything else i'm missing anything oh, else that's sticking in your crawl yes, from darren. that rams game oh no no okay <laughs> uh darren how was your thanksgiving brunch that you cooked it was okay oh my my little french toast casserole thing didn't turn out quite the way i wanted it to it was edible <laughs> see. it was edible okay but it wasn't how, how so? How, how does a French toast casserole not turn out? Uh, I just, it was one of those things where, you know how you like take the recipe and you're like, okay, I'm going to do the math here to increase it for all the people we're having. And I don't think that quite mathed the way I, I needed it to. <laughs> this wasn't the first time you made the French toast no. dish. Okay. I all think right. it was the I'm sure the effort biggest, was there. Oh, it was there. And again, very edible. A lot of people ate it. It was still very good if you didn't care what it looked like. <laughs> Well, maybe have a future as like an army cook, you know, just cook for the masses. And, <laughs> there you go. You know, or well, probably not. not or maybe I'll di- let somebody else do it. Not all that discerning over there. But it was it was good. We, wa- we we had some family over in the morning. My oldest son went to work. My younger son, who's the head freshman basketball coach at Corona, said, "I'm going to go shoot some baskets over at the high school." So I went with him, and we shot baskets on Thanksgiving. I've noticed, though, Danny, that you've asked a lot of other people how their Thanksgiving went, but we haven't heard anything about your Thanksgiving. She made some pretty good mac and cheese. I see. I did for well on, th- on actual Thanksgiving I was with my friend and her family which was nice and then we had friendsgiving which I had to explain to Craig what what that was which because he doesn't me, have any friends you you keep saying wow. that I'm not the one saying that mm-hmm. and I made ba- baked mac and cheese for friendsgiving I made two pounds worth of pasta there was a lot of baked mac and cheese mm. which was a big hit it was it was pretty good if I do say so myself <laughs> good. <laughs> She's like Kyler. A lot, a lot of confidence in the a cooking. Lot of a lot of confidence in the cooking. You know, I, I dabble. <laughs> it's funny. Speaking of big, uh, Max Starts, former offensive lineman who had a cup of coffee with the Cardinals once upon a time. Uh, you know, I said to Max, I said, you know, you don't ask women and former offensive linemen their current weight, but he's a large man. I said, what kind of damage can you do at the Thanksgiving table? And he said, well, I get a sidecar of the mac and cheese from my wife. Never heard that term before. So there's a side dish and then there's a side car. So he got he gets the side car all to himself of the mac and cheese oh, on Thanksgiving Day. That's a lot of food. Yes, that's it is. That's a lot of dairy. There's a lot of Max Starks. 
Yes, there is. <laughs> so put it that way. Okay. All right, there you go. That'll do it for this edition of uh, – by the way, who's going to uh, Permani Brothers? Uh, I know Jim Omohundro is going to go over there for the – the sandwiches with the fries included in the sandwich is the signature aspect of well, what I've, they do in Pittsburgh. I also learned that they put Pittsburgh puts fries in their salad because we had that at lunch at the facility, and apparently that's called a Pittsburgh salad. Okay, all right, well, pretty there much you go. French fries, fried foods, and whatever. French fries go with everything. With your vegetables, with your salad, with your dessert. Balance, Darren. <laughs> Yins will learn. Yins will learn the Pittsburgh ways by the end of the week. There That'll do it for this edition of Cardinals Underground, brought to you by Pacific Office Automation.